Welcome to CBS Reporters Roundtable. I'm John Dickerson. The battle is on between Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich. The former frontrunner Romney trails his rival by almost 20 points in three of the first four electoral contests. Romney, who once ignored Gingrich, is now going after him on all fronts, picking at his record, his temperament, and his family life. There's a debate in Iowa tomorrow, and that should be exciting. And on another front, the president gave a big speech this week, trying to mold himself as a modern-day Teddy Roosevelt. Can he pull it off? Joining me to discuss this is Jeff Zeleny of the New York Times, Real Clear Politics' Aaron McPike, and the AP's Phil Elliott. Um, I'll start with you, Jeff. Uh, you were in Iowa this week, where Gingrich is now ahead by anywhere from 15 to 19 points in a variety of polls. We had about 800 polls come out this week. Thank <laughs> God. Did, there was that drought period where we didn't know anything right. about Iowa, and now we know everything about Iowa. S tell us what's happening in Iowa, whether you think this Gingrich thing is real. I think it's real for the moment. I mean, polls are obviously a, a, a snapshot of what has just happened, not a predictor of what is going to happen. But I think, without a doubt, uh, Speaker Gingrich is leading the way in Iowa. But some interesting things inside the poll, the uh, CBS News, the New York Times poll, found that people are really concerned about the economy, which is not that much of a surprise, except even among evangelical voters. Uh, I think it was some 56%, uh, so more than a majority of evangelical voters say their top concern is the economy. I think we also saw some interesting things in the polls, though. Uh, New King Earth was highest across the board on, on uh, prepared to be president, um, commander in chief, uh, um, handling an international incident, except values. Values was the one question where he was lower than almost all of his rivals. So that gives an opening. It's why we saw the Mitt Romney ad this week saying, I've been married to my wife Ann for 25, whoops, check, 42 years. So uh, that is uh, what set the table for that. And the, the ad with that montage of images from the Romney, uh, Romney family album. Aaron, you wrote about evangelicals this week, right? And, and um, tell me what you think, I mean, as Jeff says, they're, they're thinking about the economy, and they don't really have their candidate this time. There's no Mike Huckabee. No Mike Huckabee. And, and you're seeing Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum really make a beeline for some of those voters and doing whatever they can to go on Christian radio stations, trying to make a play for those voters. But Michelle Bachman has seen some of her support go to Rick Santorum, so that's why she was talking about him as a potential running mate with her. Um, <laughs> But no, they don't have their candidate. They're not for Ron Paul. They're not for Mitt Romney. Um, whether or not Santorum can really do anything with that or Michelle Bachman, not sure yet. Right. Phil, what do you think about this Romney response now to Gingrich? It was ignoring him for a little while, talking mm -hmm. about the president, how many uh, rounds of golf he'd played. And then suddenly it opened up Wednesday night with John Sununu, a surrogate, attacking. Mm -hmm. Then there was a conference call Wednesday morning. Now there's a radio ad in mm -hmm. New Hampshire. The, the uh, super PAC is online. Um, they're going nuts over in Romney land. They really are. For a while, it was, I don't know if nuts is the right word here, but they definitely are paying attention. For the longest time, they had refused to engage their rivals and treated everyone else as the JV team, that they were the varsity team best suited to take on the president. Now they're realizing, well, we're coming up towards the end of sports camp, to borrow a tortured sports analogy. Summer camp's over, and someone's going to be, someone's going to play varsity, and someone's going to be cast, someone's going to be voted off. So now they really want to make sure that the lead that they had built up in terms of organization and in fundraising isn't lost in a moment as voters are just starting to tune in and seeing this as a two-man race, not between Romney and the president, but between possibly Romney and Gingrich. Yeah, but you know, I, I, the, the attacks seem to fall a little flat because as first, the, at first they went after Gingrich as a lifelong politician, which right. was just kind of the easiest first thing that they could say because they first went after Rick Perry as a career politician. Right. So they didn't really have anything to go, but now that Romney is suddenly behind Newt Gingrich, they're methodically laying out their attacks and they were telegraphing it as such. It just didn't feel very emotional and that's why I'm not sure if the, these attacks are really going to work. What do you I, think, Jeff? I think we'll find out. I mean, uh, they're doing things across the board through earned media, through paid media. They want a lot of conservative, a lot of Republican people to be sort of chattering about this and sort of uh, having a second thought about Newt Gingrich. Like, wait a minute, maybe we should. Oh, yeah, well, I remember there was something about Newt Gingrich from the 90s. The Romney campaign is going to make sure we are all fully briefed on our <laughs> Gingrich 101 and make sure voters are as well. So I don't think we know yet. I mean, there is something about Gingrich that he he's harder to attack. He's harder to sort of criticize. But um, the one place that the Romney people thought they could attack Gingrich on was immigration. During the last debate, uh, uh, you know, he laid out, uh, Speaker Gingrich laid out a uh, 
you know, what some Republicans thought was a sensible platform. He called it a humane thing. If you're in the country for a long time, you know, deeply ingrained in your church and communities, perhaps you should find a way to stay here. The Romney campaign called that amnesty, but uh, they've kind of backed off that a little bit. And our poll found that actually this. that uh, Gingrich and Rick Perry are more, uh, most people believe that they would handle immigration better, which is uh, not where the Romney people thought this was at all. So. Uh, the immigration thing was probably the most vexing thing out of our poll. I think that was fascinating in the poll. Not only do they credit the two people who were supposed to have been doomed by immigration, right. Perry and, and Gingrich, but Romney's down at like 7%, whereas Gingrich and Perry, I think, were at 20 and 21. Right. But in, the other thing was that immigration, when you asked them to choose the thing that uh, they cared about in Iowa, it was number one in 2007. Right. Now it's way down the list at way only 4% uh, deciding that it was. You were going to jump in on the Romney. Uh, uh, attack or the or or whether you know Gingrich withstands mm -hmm. any of this. Well, Aaron make, made the point that it the attack seemed to fall flat and there didn't seem to be much passion there. But when was the last time we actually saw real passion from the Romney campaign? I mean, that's his that's the hurdle he's coming up against. I just got back from South Carolina, where folks down there they're starting to, they're tuning in, they're open. It's still wide open down there. Um, but the, they, the thing that everyone keeps hitting at, and it's consistent, is the Romney authenticity and passion question, which I'm not sure a, a, a trip down memory lane and vintage photos is going to get anyone all that excited about him in the same way the thumping rock star music of the Perry ads are going to. Right, right. Well, and a, a compliment to some of this, too, in addition to you know Romney and the authenticity thing, the other thing, people are just waiting for Gingrich to screw himself up, to, to say something that he shouldn't say. But if, if that's all that we're waiting for, it may not happen. Yeah. And you know, I've talked to some strategists this week who said, you know, this is the wrong way to go to just expect that Gingrich is, is going to make a mistake because he might not. Which is why they're going after him, right? Oh, I mean, well, like, they decided that, uh, that, that they can't count on him to make a mistake. And what, what's interesting is maybe Romney, in being finally uh, attacked in a way that makes him feel threatened, gets up there perhaps in the debate on the 10th or on the 15th and actually sort of shows some passion in defending his own viability, if nothing else, and says to people, well, actually, there's something here to hang on to. Because it's clear that Gingrich, as a pugilist and as a guy who can just kind of put some passion into this race is one of the things that people like about him. It, it, it's interesting, this week the Republican Jewish Coalition um, had their speeches and, and Rick Perry went right after Newt Gingrich. And Rick Perry did seem to be sort of comatose right after Gingrich, who really lit the crowd on fire that day. It was, it was but, but you know, so many people are, are looking at Gingrich and thinking, how can this guy be in the lead now? But what they're not realizing is Gingrich has made just a huge comeback in his political career, just thinking about the end of the 90s and the very mention of the word Newt Gingrich really had people recoiling and now he's changed so much and there's, I've noticed a big, a big difference between how veteran reporters who are around in the 90s think of Newt Gingrich versus some of those of us who were not covering him in the 90s. It's, there's a different feel it's to it. It's also how some Democrats think of him. A lot of Democrats who are veterans of the Clinton administration sort of are dismissing this whole Newt Gingrich phenomenon, but some Democrats who uh, are, are sort of younger and are, are in the Obama campaign, they're like, wait a minute, maybe we should look at him through a new lens. I mean, what, why is he having this sort of appeal here? So I agree with you. I mean, the age difference here in terms of like when you uh, started tuning into Newt uh, sort of changes how you view him. Phil, you were in South Carolina. What's your sense of South Carolina and its role in this drama? I mean, Gingrich has a, a pretty good organization there, or has one anyway. He has one. He has the largest organization down there. And it's surprising to me that the largest organization in South Carolina at this point is nine paid staffers. It is just a fraction of what we saw four years ago on both sides. Um, he's got five offices. They're making thousands of calls to supporters every day. He's working hard in South Carolina because you can say what you want about Gingrich's a, as a personality, he is a his, he is a student of history, and every Republican nominee since 1980 has won the South Carolina primary. He there's a reason for that. He would ar he argues, and he wants to tap into that um, because Iowa's going to do its thing, New Hampshire's going to do its thing, and then all eyes go to South Carolina. Um, and those two states are quirky in their own ways. And a lot of the critics of the nominating process say they don't accurately represent what you the qualities you need heading into the general election. Is the Romney vote in South Carolina the old McCain vote? Is it all in Charleston? And, and I mean, does he have a shot there, Romney? Or you would think that South Carolina might not be a state for him. Evangelicals have huge sway down there. Both Gingrich and Rick Perry were courting them this week, uh, doing uh, counter-programming against each other in a sort of way on Thursday, yesterday. Um, but at the end of the day, this is evangelicals there have a huge sway in the nominating process there. 
and a lot of them never came around to Mitt Romney's Mormon faith four years ago, and there's no reason to suspect that that is going to change now. Jeff, uh, Iowa, you're, you know the state well. When I was in Gingrich's uh, headquarters there this week, they were still setting up the tables onto which to put the phones to make the calls to get the precinct captains. This has been a funny race this year where organization hasn't meant what it used to. On the other hand, you still need to do something. What's your sense of the Gingrich boom and its ability to capture, to get an organization to actually capture that boom? It's going to have to be organic to get people to the, uh, the caucuses on the night of January 3rd. Every, every Gingrich supporter I uh, spoke to uh, when I was out there earlier this week, um, sort of having second conversations with people who participated in our poll, the people who like Gingrich said, but I don't exactly know how to uh, caucus for him. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And Gingrich had one of the lowest um, uh, percentages of, of uh, people who have been contacted by the campaign. So uh, it's going to have to rely on huge commitment. People are going to have to figure out exactly where to go, um, um, et cetera. Um, I had one person ask me, so can I vote absentee in this? Because I'm going to be in Arizona. <laughs> like, well, no, you can't. You actually have to be physically in the caucus on the night of the third. So organization, it does matter. If he happens to win Iowa without it, it will be a really an unusual and sort of definitely a change in sort of in how the Iowa caucuses have traditionally worked. Does I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just uh, organization matters. Erin, you're going to go out there this week to Iowa. What are you looking for? Uh, Perry's bus tour, actually. I, I still keep hearing strategists say that they think Rick Perry could make a last-minute push. And so I I'm actually curious how Rick Perry will do and who he'll start to draw from mm -hmm. if he's going to commit himself to Iowa for the next month. So. He's doing a bus tour. He's good at the retail thing. Right. Uh, sort of, he's the anti-Gingrich. Gingrich is not a big, although he may do, Gingrich may also do a bus tour, but he's not a real glad hander. But, but Perry is sort of born to do that. Um, and, and is the theory that, okay, Gingrich falls. Gingrich has been getting a lot of conservatives. Those conservatives are never going to go to Romney. Mm -hmm. in, in the CBS uh, New York Times poll, is amazing. Within the Tea Party and Evangelicals, Gingrich beats Romney 40 to 10. I mean, it's a 30-point gap. Um, and Romney is the only candidate whose uh, unfavorables are, are worse than his, or higher than his favorables. So they're not going to go to Romney. So then is that the idea? They, 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 they kind to, of they rumble to over to Perry. Right. But, per but morale in Austin at, at Perry's headquarters is awful right now. So let's see how much they can put into this bus tour and if they can get some of the early buzz back. And one thing that's happening in the middle of all this are a couple debates, one tomorrow, one a week from uh, Thursday. Thursday. So, I mean, he, <laughs> if, if he has a tough debate performance, it's hard to get, you know, a people to come out for him. So right. he's also sitting on a mountain of cash to do ads, which, okay, there's a, th you have a choice. You can run this video of a de de horrible debate performance, or you can run this video of a new ad that came out in the last 24 hours, and newness trumps badness in <laughs> politics. But and although he has set a new level of badness. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, let me ask you, we'll, we'll do a roundtable on this question, which is, you were mentioning the candidates. Um, they're not out there like they used to be. Is this because the debates have played a bigger role in this, uh, in this nominating process? I mean, when I was just in Iowa, it was basically the Ron Paul show. And, uh, and we should talk about Ron Paul and, and Iowa, but, but let's talk, stick here on this question of the cam candidates not really campaigning the way they used to. The, can uh, the campaign landscape is a lot different than it was four years ago. People didn't know how really to use Facebook effectively. Twitter didn't exist during the primaries last time in an effective way. Now, instead of getting press releases, I get the tweet sent to my cell phone, and that is just as an effective way in some, in some, to some voters a way to communicate. And it's quick, it's easy, it's cheap, and lets them focus on calling through the list to build organizations, theoretically, calling donors to build up war chests. And it, it keeps them refreshed. And you don't have tired and exhausted candidates heading into New Hampshire and crying in diners like we had with Senator Clinton four years ago. Although the crying worked out for work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's that tough balance between running them ragged or, yeah. What do you think, Jeff? What do you, is that, uh, you know, why don't we have them barnstorming? And will we finally, now that, that, that I was so close, start I think we will a little bit more here at the end. But look, it, it is just a, ch uh, a slow uh, change in how campaigns have developed. A big part of also is the Fox News effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, more than four years ago, these Republican candidates were using Fox very effectively you know, because you are also appearing in the living rooms of Iowa caucus goers and New Hampshire primary voters when you show up on Fox. And, and that has changed the, the uh, dynamic of of the campaign, but I think you will see at the end a much more retail campaigning. But uh, it's called a campaign for a reason. Some of these exercises, it's tough, but 
candidates get much better when they have to take questions from voters, tough questions from voters and other things. So I think that uh, whoever the nominee um, um, ends up being um, will be stronger you know, for more retail campaigning uh, um, as opposed to a weaker. Except that since they're not doing it, maybe they're going to have an uphill battle once we do have a nominee against Barack Obama, who's the king of some of this stuff. Let's talk, uh, two last topics are, are Ron Paul and uh, and the debates that we've got coming up. Um, was there a look, Paul, what did you see in South Carolina? Paul. Uh, so yard signs, you can see them, yes. you know, even in Alaska, in the tundra, at the farthest reaches yes. of man's um, dominion. But um, what did you see in South Carolina in terms of a poll organization? He's got a legion of supporters that are organizing on his behalf, not necessarily with him. That he may show up somewhere, and there's an event planned for him, packed house, people making phone calls on his behalf, sending emails, sending money in small dollar increments all without the direct involvement of the Paul campaign. It really is a grassroots organization. Um, it's more sophisticated than it was four years ago, and now headquarters knows how to at least monitor what's happening and try to piggyback on it. But Ron Paul has his base of support, that is, and they're going to be with him no matter what, even after it's become apparent that he's not going to be the nominee, if in fact that becomes the case. Um, and they're going to stay with him again four years from now, hoping he makes yet another run. And that base is committed. I was in Boone, uh, Iowa last night in the in the public library there, and there was, I mean, it wasn't just standing room only. There were people like virtually like on each other's shoulders to be there for him. But it does seem like he's got that, there is that ceiling, always been his problem. Can he grow his vote? But it, it we thought it was 10%, right? Yeah. And now he's right. notching up to 20%. So he's, you know, whatever they've been doing has made a difference. These ads talking about how he was the real candidate who never supported TARP while some of the other big candidates did at the time. But he's, he's doing better than, than we think. And, and there's this, now this question of can he win Iowa? Right. You can win Iowa with a mid-20s performance, no right? No question at all. And he has, uh, um, his supporters, again, are least likely to uh, uh, move on to anyone else. I mean, his supporters right now are committed. They're frozen in. Um, I think it, uh, he, he does, though, have some type of a ceiling. We don't know what that is. Some of his national security uh, positions are sort of frightening, quite frankly, to some Republicans. But beyond that, he has a big uh, reservoir of support. And people who go to the Iowa caucuses know they're not picking the next president. They're trying to influence the debate. So, so I think that uh, you can absolutely support Ron Paul on January 3rd and comfortably you know, go on to uh, vote for someone else if he's not the nominee. But also interestingly on him, he is organizing down the line. He's opening offices in all these, uh, all these caucus states that are in February, in March. He is going to be here <laughs> until the fat lady sings. We'll find out when that and is. And he may be dogging other candidates. He may be dogging the other candidates with his ads. Yeah, he's I mean, going he's after been, Gingrich this week. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's gone after everyone, everyone. except <laughs> Mitt Romney. It's v yeah, and but y you make a good point, and he's trying to influence the debate. I mean, that's what his candidacy is based on. It's just influencing influencing the debate. And I spoke to him a couple weeks ago when he was giving some speeches in Washington, and I said, "So, do you actually want to be president?" And he kind of looked down and shrugged and said, "Sure." And then later in the day, I was saying, "Well, why do you want to be president?" And he couldn't answer the question. He kept on telling you it was a silly question and it should be obvious. Well, I'm pretty sure in 1979 the answer wasn't obvious to Ted Kennedy, but right. Rob Paul doesn't seem to have an answer. He just really wants to get, have his issues out there. Now he's not even, you know, he's talking about potential, you know, seeing how far he can go. But maybe we'll see an independent candidacy just to. Just to keep, influence the debate. Just to keep making <laughs> making noise and, and getting the coverage. All right, we're going to wrap it up here quickly. I'm going to get some thoughts on the debate. What do you think? What do you think on the 10th? What's going to happen? What, what are you looking for? Is it just basically Romney Gingrich, or what else do you think? It's also might it might be their last chance to make their closing arguments to candidates. We saw them start making their final pitches to camp, camp uh, their supporters this week. Uh, this re we're really down to the wire. We're down two days. We're 25 days away from Iowa right now. If they can't seal the deal right now, they're not going to. Voters are going to start. Voters and caucus goers need to be reassured one way or another about these candidates. And right now, it's closing the deal with them while not making a mistake and in introducing new chinks in their armor. Right. Dark horse in the debate. Mm. Well, and go ahead. What were you? Well, just I, I was just going to say, uh, all the candidates not named Newt and Romney. Do they go after Romney finally, or do they go after Newt? Right. I I can't wait to see. <laughs> Jeff, I'm going to switch up on you unless you have a.
passionate, burning answer on the debate question, which is we, I did want to talk a little bit about the president's speech, which is, so what was your take? The president gave a speech in which he sort of fashioned himself after Teddy Roosevelt talked about uh, Amer the American experience being one of fairness and where everybody was kind of yeah, treated equally. What's, what's your sense of just the, that speech, whether it'll mean anything and what they were going for? Well, I think we're going to see that speech uh, replayed in ads and, and things that the president uh, is uh, is going to do, and perhaps sooner rather than uh, later, the uh, White House and the and the reelection campaign is is uh, weighing sort of how um, aggressively to be involved in the Republican primary. They already have been involved in um, a big extent, but I think on the speech itself, he is trying to show that he is fighting for the middle class. He uh, had basically have given up on the fact that. Uh, you know, the jobs argument is going to uh, work in a huge respect because things are frozen in place sort of where they are. The unemployment rate has fallen a little bit, but he's going to be that fighter for the middle class to trying to tap into this, uh, you know, this uh, sentiment about income inequality and other things. So I thought it was a good speech that he did, and it seemed like he was sort of getting um, back on his game in some respects. And it also, um, once he's outside of Washington, he just uh, seems to have sort of an extra uh, bounce in his uh, step, if you will. So I think it was an effective speech, it frames the argument, uh, which is a tough argument that he has to thread over the next 11 right, months. Right, coming up with something after hope and change. Jeff right. Saloni, thank you. Aaron McPike, thank you. And Phil Elliott, thank you. And thanks all of you for joining us. That's it for Hot Sheet Live today. Join us here every Friday at 1230. I'm John Dickerson. Have a great weekend. Thank you.